Hello and welcome to the Irish History Podcast. My name is Finn Dwyer and this is The Four Horse Explosion, where history was lost. While Partisans, my weekly series on Irish involvement in the Spanish Civil War, begins on Monday, this is an extra show on one of the most controversial events in the Irish Civil War, an event that continues to haunt Irish history into the present day. I am, of course, talking about the destruction of the Four Courts, and in particular one specific building inside it, the Public Records Office. This explosion saw centuries of Irish historical records stored in the Public Records Office destroyed. And over the course of this podcast, I'll be recording at the site of the explosion before I head up to the National Archives, where I'll meet Zoe Reid, who'll tell us about the scale of the destruction caused and show us some of the documents salvaged from the ruins of the Public Records Office and what's been done today to preserve them. Before we start, I want to explain a bit about the backstory to this podcast and something related that's coming up. So a few months ago, I was really honoured to be invited to be the ambassador for Explore Your Archive Week, which is coming up at the end of November. This is a great series of events organised by the Archives and Records Association to highlight the fact that archives are there to be utilised by everyone, not just historians or researchers. Now, as someone who uses archives on a daily basis, I was really keen to be involved in this week. When I started using archives, I was surprised you didn't need to be an expert, just someone with a keen interest. Anyway, there's going to be lots of great events across Ireland, both north and south of the border. So keep an eye out for what's on in your area. You can find out more at araireland.ie. Anyway, it was during a meeting about National Archive Week that I happened to inquire about the Public Records Office, the archives that had been held there, and Joanne Carroll from the National Library put me in contact with Zoe in the National Archives, and that's where this podcast came from. So thanks to Joanne and Zoe for making this podcast possible. Now, let's get on with the show. This podcast revolves around one of the biggest explosions in the history of Dublin and I'm actually standing at what was ground zero in that explosion, the four courts in Dublin. You can probably hear the sound of traffic behind me, it's rush hour and I am pretty close to the city centre of Dublin. But we need to turn the clock back nearly a century to 1922 and to June the 30th specifically. The situation in Dublin that summer could not have been more tense. Just over six months had passed since the War of Independence had formally ended. However, the future had never been more uncertain. The IRA had split over the issue of the treaty with the United Kingdom that had brought that war to an end. There was no question it was a highly controversial treaty. Ireland was to be partitioned. Six counties in the North East were to remain part of the United Kingdom, while the 26 counties were not entirely independent either. For example, Irish TDs, that's Members of Parliament, had to take an oath of allegiance to the British monarchy. This outraged many members of the IRA. Tensions had grown through the spring and into the summer of 1922. Tensions that would eventually lead to the Civil War. On April the 22nd, armed members of the IRA occupied this complex in front of me here, the Four Courts in Dublin. It is and was then an iconic building in the city, dominating the quays of the River Liffey. If you're not familiar with it, you actually probably have seen pictures of the building. It has a beautiful facade and its reflection is often photographed shimmering in the River Liffey. Anyway, back in 1922, the occupation of this building by IRA units presented the new government with a major problem. What were they to do? The people inside the building were, after all, prominent members of the IRA, many of whom had played a leading role in the War of Independence. However, on the other hand, they were, in the eyes of some, jeopardising the new Free State's independence. While the story is far more complex than that summary, what we're concerned with is what happened at the end of that occupation. Over two months passed before the government decided to take action, and on June 28th they took the fateful decision to remove the Four Courts garrison, as they were known, by force. To this end, they began shelling the complex. This went on for two days. On June 30th, as the IRA units inside the Four Courts were preparing to surrender, an almighty explosion rocked the city, just across the road from where I'm standing now. The specific building that exploded had been used by the IRA as a munitions store and it was more or less destroyed. Indeed, such was the scale of the explosion that a huge mushroom cloud rose over the building and was visible across the city. I'll actually post a picture of that with the podcast. It must have been a remarkable sight. Now, debate has raged as to what precisely led to the detonation of the explosives being stored in the building. 
but I'm not going to get into that here because what this show focuses on is something far more important. What precisely was inside the building? You see, it was in fact the Public Records Office of Ireland which contained Irish historical records stretching back to the 13th century. The scene in the aftermath of the explosion was frightful. Ernie O'Malley, a leading member of the IRA, actually inside the four courts, wrote this evocative recollection in his book A Singing Flame. As we stood near the gate, there was a loud, shattering explosion. The munitions block and a portion of headquarters block went up in flames and smoke. The yard was littered with chunks of masonry and smouldering records. Pieces of white paper were gyrating in the upper air like seagulls. The explosion seemed to give an extra push to roaring orange flames which formed patterns across the sky. What he is describing there were documents that stretched back nearly 700 years. Now this sets the scene for today's podcast because next I'm heading up to the National Archives on Bishop Street where I'm going to talk to Zoe Reid who nearly 100 years later is rescuing documents from that fire and she is going to give us far more detail about what happened in the immediate aftermath in 1922 what exactly was lost and what has been saved. If we're lucky, we might even get to see some of the documents that did survive. I'll pick up the story at Bishop Street. So I'm inside uh, the National Archives in Bishop Street and this is a building that I actually come to quite a bit but I'm in a very different part of the building today. I'm here with Zoe Reid who works here in the National Archives. And Zoe has taken me, I guess, in behind the scenes. Zoe, do you want to introduce yourself? Hello, I'm Zoe Reid and I'm the Senior Conservator here at the National Archives, um, a job I've been lucky to have for the last 17 years. I've already outlined some of the big events that happened at the Four Courts, the explosion um, that happened at the end of the occupation of the Four Courts. Do you want to tell us a bit, Zoe, about what was actually in that building? I mentioned Ernie O'Malley talking about seeing pieces of white paper in, in, in the sky, those pieces of white paper, uh, have a, the loss of this has had a detrimental impact on Irish history. In terms of the collections um, that were held within the repository, it was six floors of collections um, that spanned over 100,000 square feet of shelving. And they were organised, as archivists love to do, quite rightly, into 5,500 series of records. So they would have been organised into court records, um, legal records, um, records relating to civil matters, census returns, which is probably one of the most significant losses in terms of Irish genealogy. Um, Census records were held in the four courts. Um, There would have been records relating to basically everything that was in the four courts had been listed and a book and a guide had been published to the contents of the office by Herbert Woods in 1919 and that becomes today um, the book that everybody refers to and has referred to because this tells us what was there and then we can see from that what has been lost Um, and so Woods guide is a hugely important piece of uh, history. I think there's certainly a perception out there that everything that was in that building was destroyed in that fire but uh, do you want to talk a bit about the aftermath, the days afterwards, or the weeks afterwards, where people who had worked in the public records office went back to the site and they actually started to rescue documents that had survived? Essentially, yes, it was a salvage operation. And the salvage operation began in July, on the 13th of July, 1922. And the staff at the time um, had been assigned an OPW engineer. Basically, that was from a structural point of view, looking at the, at the site to make sure that it was safe for staff to go into. The staff went in, and if you can imagine going into your office space and everything just being amongst rubble and in debris, and they started to identify and pick up things out of the rubble. And that's what they did. Um, a team of staff were still investigating. Um, the staff who were involved were trying to piece together the history of that a bit more um, as we worked towards the centenary of that event. Um, but very much the results of their labours are what we're getting to conserve today. Um, so what they did is they went in with standard archival um materials at the time, brown paper and string and labels and they packed everything up and they put them into parcels and they labelled them as best they could and that's what we've held here in the National Archives for the last 95 years until we started looking at it in 2017. And what condition was that in then? Like it must have been, like obviously they're essentially just pulling out something that's survived in a fire. Exactly, the material that was paper, um, some of it's just totally gone, paper charred and went 
went into charcoal fragments essentially um, for very badly damaged material and um, the vellum survived but the vellum reacted to the heat of the fire in lots of different ways and that's what I'll be able to show you here today Finn we've got lots of examples of how the vellum kind of distorts and crinkles and then we also have some examples of material that was wrapped and salvaged but is actually still in very good condition um, and that's really interesting to compare and contrast the two uh, the other thing that I would say is that the job that the staff did at the time was fantastic because it it put a pause on any further damage happening and um, so basically they were getting the stuff out of the rubble they were taking it out of the exposed environment and the weather conditions because it was an open sort of rubble site at that stage and um, everything was destroyed and what, by wrapping it in parcels and putting it safely inside a building on shelves, it's been fine. It hasn't degraded any more. Um, now, some of the material, as you'll see today, is almost, it's hard to identify it as a document. It looks more like a natural history specimen. Okay. Um, it looks like bits of coral. They're really dramatic. They're stunning to look at. And then other pieces look as if they were stored perfectly for the last 100 years. Um, there are documents from the 17th century, from the 15th century. Um, and they're in perfect condition. And so we have that bizarre contrast um, between the two. But for us, it's been a hugely exciting process um, whereby we started off with a survey where we got to open up all those parcels, find out what was in them, document them, um, do a conservation assessment of them. And now we're beginning to do the conservation of them. We won't be conserving everything because unfortunately that's too big a job. But working with historians and the archivists, we can identify key things that we think should be conserved moving forward. And what was the oldest document that actually survived? The oldest, there's a small collection and they're just, they're stunning, but they're unfortunately they're all fragments. Um, Richard II, Elizabeth I, Henry the uh, sixth, to which yes exactly I go wow um, and I'll, I'll be able to show you some of those today but they are just fragments um, and through working through this process over the last sort of 18 months what I've realised is it's some of the larger documents that maybe come from the 16th and 17th century that survived complete that perhaps will, will definitely warrant our investment in terms of conservation time yep. because they will generate so much information for people and the fragments are amazing um, and absolutely beautiful and stunning, but they are just that. They're tiny fragments. Um, Maybe we could go and look at some of these? Definitely. Documents. So we've come out into a conservation workroom and Zoe has a box. Actually, it's quite similar to boxes. If you come into the National Archives, you get a box similar enough to this with documents in it. But Zoe has this and I'm very excited to see what's inside this. <laughs> OK, it is. It's a standard archival box we've got made. And it's a box within a box in this case, Finn, because this is quite... Now, this is one of the ones... We're starting at the very end in terms of condition, OK? And this is a box of paper wills. Oh. Um, yeah, that was put into this box. The box is fine, so I know the staff at the time this would have been amongst the rubble and what they did was there are three boxes like this they scooped up the paper wills and put them into this box for safekeeping just to explain to people at home we're, kind of, we're looking into it and it actually does look like the ashes from a fire a lot of it it does um, there's a, a page out or there's a, there's a fragment there of paper yeah, just close there's about the four wills there folded wills everything was folded at the time that's how it would have been stored um, legal documents were all folded um, and so what you have are sort of a, a row of um, are, which are essentially now charcoal um, if we were to start handling them they will just go like charcoal and they will just crumble in our hands now the thing is I can't say I can do magic and I can do an awful lot when it comes to conservation and conserving material and I'll be able to show you what I can do. But my attitude would be very much um, that these are worth keeping. One, because they show us the extent of the damage in terms of paper records and what happened to them. But also, who's to say that in another 95 years, Certainly. technology has made another jump and a leap and suddenly that these documents can be handled or x-rayed and... There's already progression in terms of X-raying very, very badly burnt and friable material, as we'd call it. Um, if you think of, say, the Dead Sea Scrolls, something okay. like that. Um, there's a, a process whereby they can be X-rayed. Um, X-ray tomography is the, is the scientific term for it. 
and then with computer algorithms those x-rays can be analyzed and essentially they can do a virtual unwrapping so that's what in terms of so that would be one of the things that's in the worst condition okay and you can see look even just taking it out there we go we've ended up with fragments and charcoal bits okay so something that survived that's in slightly better condition here's the label so it's vellum so it's animal skin um, it was approximately, to describe it, it's probably about 150 separate sheets of vellum, which were, would have all been rolled in together to create one legal document, one roll, as it was known. And this is common pleas and outlaws, outlawries. So again, it's a legal document. But what's happened in the, in the heat of the fire is the parchment has become scorched and burnt, but it's also... It's shriveled or it's shrunk, essentially. Because of the heat of the fire, moisture has left the parchment. If you think okay. about parchments like a skin. So moisture has left it. And so it's become very dry and crisp and brittle. Now, the exciting thing is you can see that the writing's still very clear. If you yep. look at it here, you can see writing very clearly. But you can see you've got here the skin, the vellum has kind of distorted and shrunk. You're saying one of the key problems is that all the moisture has been... Yeah removed from it so th yes. I guess that has to be reintroduced reduced. okay so part of the key um, process for conservation will be very slowly and very gently and very carefully reintroducing moisture to this document yeah. and if you want I can show you a demonstration of how That'd I do that fantastic. not on this one <laughs> but on some single sheets of vellum okay so what we've got here are some small single sheets mm -hmm. which were receipts from the court and you again can see how these would have all been put together laced together on a spike you can see the holes there oh, in yeah, the centre yeah. but you can see how the single sheet how it's really distorted the vellum has shrunk and even the writing has shrunk so we're going to walk over here and I'm going to show you some of the fun conservation things I have so just to explain <laughs> to people uh, I'm trying to explain what this it's a uh, I close this down it looks like an incubator it looks like <laughs> that's exactly what it looks like. an incubator it's a plastic or pers it looks like a perspex, perspex. dome yep. over a table and uh, it has a hose going in at one side yeah so the hose is attached to a thing called an ultrasonic humidifier and what that's doing is taking water and turning the water into a cool fog, essentially. So in very basic terms, it's like giving the piece of vellum a facial. OK, if you can think about it. And I've got my, um, d my reader inside so I can see what the temperature and the relative humidity are. And what I'm doing is I'm going to increase the relative humidity, so the level of moisture in the air surrounding the vellum document. Um, and what this does is very slowly and very gently, without causing any damage to the inks, will make the vellum kind of soft and supple again. And so under here, because I just keep them covered overnight, I've got two examples. So, so this underwent the same process. This was humidified yesterday. So this would have been in a similar stage? Uh... It, this, was, this one was actually in a large roll that were put together between 1665 and 1668 certificates for adventurers so basically people who were being given land or st um, during that time of conflict wow. um, and these are the legal documents to say the land now belongs to them you can see the date there 1668 really clear oh, at well, the top yeah, yeah. Um, and if I move some of the magnets this is sheet number 46 to so explain to people just at home though this is incredible like you would never ever think that this had ever been in a fire no uh, it's like pristine I've seen Maybe the document's not this old, but that come out of collections that just true wear and tear yes. are in a uh, lot worse condition than this. And then once it's humidified and there's moisture and it's soft and supple, not very wet. I mean, I'm talking it's very gentle um, yep. distinction. And in terms of the documents then that were rescued in 1922, mm -hmm. what is the time span, do you think? Like this looks like a pretty... Labour intensive? Yeah, time yes. consuming process. It like is. if that's one of... What do they, 46 there? 46, that's one of uh, 120. So um, that's like a year's work or something? No, it, well, be? yes and no. I mean, no, I'm doing kind of one or two every day okay. um, of, of those ones. Um, and I've actually got through a lot. I think the, the difficulty, and I mentioned earlier, is for a conservator, we have a knowledge and we want to make things um, safe to handle and access. 
um, and the integrity of the document is key. So I might look at a document and say, oh, this needs conservation. But what I've learned through this project is actually it's the historians and the archivists who have more of a knowledge. And okay. so we're working really closely with them. We've, we've created a list of everything that was surveyed. Um, and we've given those, some of those lists to archivists and historians and said, OK, can you identify from the, the label list what is of interest? So they've kind of come back with their top ten. A good example is there's one document, one parcel, we opened it up, and it looks like a football of paper. Yeah. And it's sort of this round of paper, lots of paper sheets mashed together, and there's a metal spike through it and a, a sort of a base to the metal spike. And we were looking at it and going, and going, well, what is it? And then we realised it was actually the docket um, holder. So whenever people would have gone into the public record of office at the time, requested to see a document, very much like today in the National Archives, there would have been a docket produced to say, Finn yeah. Dora wants to see this document, he's sitting at this table. And those are the docket returns, the docket receipts. Wow. Um, in terms of conservation, it might be interesting to see who was going into the reading yeah. room but in terms of historical of course, it's, not particularly, it's not particularly yeah, it's a so snapshot it's a, of a couple of months presumably in, in or a year <laughs> by the look of it they didn't clear the, 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 the stand very often but that's what I mean in terms of I could look at that and say that's a great conservation challenge but in terms of what the yeah. history that we'll get from that isn't you know, isn't huge compared to something like this to presume, compare to yeah, something like, like this a land grant or something like exactly. that it's, it's huge yeah. um, and then just I guess maybe kind of bringing this kind of full circle back into the 21st century, archives all across Ireland to an extent must be haunted by that event that happened even 100 years ago. And do you, has it shaped the way people treat? Like I was up in, for example, I was up in the Registry of Deeds. Yeah. And they have huge, what seem to be fire doors that weigh yes. tons oh, yeah. between all yeah. the... And is that a legacy of that or is... Actually, beforehand, and even if, surprisingly, if you go back to the construction of the forecourt site, um, they were very conscious uh, and very aware of the hazards of fire. Okay. And so between the two buildings, between the record house and the record treasury, there is a four metre fire break. Because they always thought it was the record house, which is where people worked and the offices and where the reading room was. They thought that was the vulnerable part okay. because it was pre-electric. There were open fires, there were gas lights. They thought that was where there was going yeah. to be the fire. They never expected it to be the repository and the storage area. I suppose by the nature of it, they could never have prepared no, for, and you couldn't, couldn't really prepare for a, yeah. a conflict of that. Of that nature, or that it would be occupied. Um, and that yeah. brings you into the whole area of cultural heritage property being occupied during wars and things, yeah. um, which we're seeing, obviously, unfortunately, more and more in this century. Um, but yeah, so it is really interesting. Um, so yeah, I think it did shape. Everybody is extremely conscious of it. Um, and in many ways, people have had to be very creative in their historical research and find other ways to find out, say, because the census records were lost, people have had to look to other records yeah. to find out that information, um, which is, is um, a plus and a minus. <laughs> if I'm honest, I think. Um, but yeah, the value and the appreciation. But essentially, the archives that were held are everybody's history. And they were the history of the state at the time. They were the history of the country. Um, and as we move forward, you know, the, making sure that archives are open and accessible um, is a huge mission, but one that is hugely valuable. Um, it's not ours to try and hide things. It's ours to make sure that things are presented so that history can be interpreted and viewed and valued. Before I finish, I want to thank Zoe Reid in the National Archives, who is very generous with her time in showing me the work she does. I'll be back on Monday, November the 18th, with the first episode of Partisans, Irish Stories from the Spanish Civil War. Until then, Sloan. Sloan.